This is Colonia Cast, episode 42. Today we're joined by Dr. Gerald Kukling, who is a senior research scientist of the Western Australian Department of Environment and Conservation. Uh, he's also an adjunct senior lecturer at the School of Animal Biology at the University of Western Australia. Uh, Dr. Kukling has done a variety of work with turtles and tortoises, ranging from ecological work uh, with turtles in Madagascar to conservation work in South Asia. And he's a principal investigator on the Western Swamp Turtle Recovery Team uh, and has done a lot of work with this species. He's also specialized in the reproductive biology of turtles and tortoises and wrote the book, The Reproductive Biology of the Colonia, uh, that we'll link in the episode description. Um, we're also joined by Scott Thompson, who's a research biologist at the Centro de Estudios de Colonias de Amazonia. Uh, Scott, this is his fourth appearance on the podcast, uh, and we're really uh, grateful for his dedication to spreading his knowledge about turtles on, a, on various platforms. Uh, so we're going to be talking to both of them today, predominantly about the, the western swamp turtle. Uh, a really interesting species that's endemic to a small area of Western Australia, uh, hearing more about the biology, conservation, and anatomy of this species. So thank you both for joining us today. Uh, it's an honor to have you guys on. So uh, Jack, if you want to get us started with the first question, we'll just kind of roll into this. All right. I only have uh, one I don't think I have the first question, I think. All right, I'll, I'll get us started. Oh, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll start off with uh, just uh, – we've, we've discussed this with uh, Scott before, but uh, Dr. Kuklin, um, I'm just curious, sir, do we like to start, start everything off with this for every guest? Uh, what, how did you get interested in turtles? Uh, and specifically, where did your interest in sort of the reproductive biology uh, sort of develop? Okay, uh, first of all, I just want to, to correct the department I work for half time at the moment is now called Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions. It used to be Environment and Conservation, but the name changed. Sorry. Uh, so my interest in turtles, well, as long as I can remember, according to my mother, uh, who died last year. Uh, she claims that when I was about, I think it was about two years old, my father at that time, Austria, I was obviously born and grown up in Austria. Austria was still after the Second World War an occupied country. And so turtles or foreign turtles were not easy to get. But my father, who worked in the arts, uh, community, he uh, had the opportunity to go to uh, Paris and brought back two hatchling radiate slider turtles, which he then kept in a small aquarium. And so when I was in the second year of my life, or two years old, I was obviously very fascinated by this radiate slider turtle hatchlings. And so according to my mother, the very first word I ever said was Schulti, which is short for Schildkröte in German, means turtle. And so according to my mother, yes, my interest in turtles is uh, much longer than I can remember. And it, well... <laughs> it's, it's Many of us have a similar experience with red eared sliders being one of the first... Uh, for our first experiences with turtles. I had two that were given to me when I was uh, four or five years old and that made a lasting impression. Uh, and it was part of the yes. reason I've developed such an interest in turtles. Yes, no, I was four or five years old. I graduated into keeping two Hermann's tortoises in the sand pit in the backyard of, my, of the house of my family. But yes, my interest in turtles is certainly uh, was well developed very early on in my life. It's really interesting and uh, sort of curious because you you sort of took it in a, a different direction than a lot of people in terms of focusing in on on the reproductive biology. Uh, 
uh, for your your uh, dissertation work and, and doctoral work. Um, sir, how did you sort of get down that path? What was how did you get involved with that work? Well, uh, <clears throat> in the early 1970s, uh, when there were not many people reading like European tortoises or turtles, uh, when I was basically an undergraduate, I was already breeding, uh, well, most European terrestrial tortoises and certainly also Amis orbicularis, the European pond turtle in the backyard of my parents. And, well, I, I was really interested in the whole reproductive uh, biology. And in, when I, I studied in Vienna, at the University of Vienna, and there was, at that time, there were no people working with turtles. Uh, so I proposed, like, the PhD a project I did was my proposal to a professor who simply accepted it because I thought, well, if I propose something which really sounds interesting, then he will support it, even so he had nothing to do with turtles. And yes, then I had to basically develop my own program and did part of the PhD at uh, the Veterinary University because there was a possibility to do actually uh, radio immunoassays with steroid hormones. There was a group working with domestic animals doing this. At that time, you couldn't actually, well, the, all the radio immunoassays were at a very early stage of development. So you couldn't simply order antibodies and all this at uh, some company. They were all developed on their own there in the veterinary university by basically producing them in rabbits. And so it was really, I started working with reproductive endocrinology of turtles I was one of the first, but uh, at the same time, but probably a bit earlier, Paul Licht in Berkeley and his research group also worked with radio immunosays, mainly with sea turtles, but also some freshwater turtles in the United States. Uh, so there was not, when I started, there was not much guidance to basically go by and they had to find out and develop a lot of things myself that's that's exciting for for uh a, a sort of a student in, in in kind of the 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 early on stage of career to have to do a lot of that though sort of breakthrough type of analyses and stuff that hadn't been done before so it's that's a cool thing and so so you started out with that work um in at the university of vienna uh, but then you had sort of you shifted location quite a bit to to Western Australia, uh, and and that's I believe sort of when you or, or when you got involved with the Western swamp turtle sort of conservation work. Um, but I'm sort of curious about what what prompted the move um, from from Europe to Australia, and what was your first experience with the swamp turtle? Well, my. My first experience with the swamp turtle, and one reason I'm interested in is that as an undergraduate, <laughs> I think I was 20 at the time, I got a job at the archaeological collection of the Museum of Natural History in Vienna, where also the type specimen is. And well, either by chance or uh, maybe I helped a bit my desk was in the room where all the turtle specimens were. And yes, I tried to, I also was responsible for basically managing the library of the herpetological collection in the museum. 
Uh, so I had access and possibility to read a lot of literature. And I soon found out that the Western Swamp Tortoise was really at that time considered, well, pretty, pretty much unknown and one of the rarest turtles on earth. So this was my first uh, exposure, so to say, to Western Swamp Turtles. Pseudomedora. And I actually I had a permanent job at the museum. And uh, stupid as I was when I was young, I quit the, store, the job because I thought I don't want to spend my life looking at pickled turtles. And I really wanted, yes, to go into reproductive biology and so on. And so Yes, I, I then did my PhD and then worked as a postdoc in Germany at the University of Got Göttingen and also worked basically with uh, hormone physiology in turtles. And then after two years, I thought, okay, do I really want to spend my life uh, basically in Woman labs somewhere in the basement of big buildings, or do I want to do any something else? So I, I decided to change again and then went first to Madagascar and then, well, did some work in Madagascar, but then uh, at a conference in Paris, in, in France, it was not Paris, I met the zoology professor from the University of Western Australia in Perth and talked to him and asked him about Pseudomedura, what's going on? And he said, ah, look, we are just going extinct. And I said, well, there's nobody doing anything with them. And he said, well, the conservation department, it was the Department of Conservation and Land Management, they do not let anyone do anything. At that time, he had another postdoc, Mary Mendonza, who actually did her PhD in the lab of Paul Licht in Berkeley. She looked at uh, the reproduction and, well, control of reproduction, so to say, in the stinkpot turtle, uh, Stenotherus odoratus. So basically, we did some parallel work, Mary with uh, Stenoteros, and I worked for my PhD with Testudo Hermanae, and without knowing of each other. And she happened to be a postdoc with Don Bradshaw in Perth at that time too. And so Don told me that even Mary, so she's a real expert for turtle, turtle reproduction too. Uh, she wasn't able to do anything, organize anything for the Western Swamp Turtle. And so I said to Don Bradshaw, okay, what do you think? Could I come to Perth to do something? And he said, well, he, he invited me to come to Perth. To, he said, if I apply from Europe, to basically do something with Pseudomedora, it will not work out. So he suggested he will invite me to do some work with the local long neck turtle, Kilodino oblonga, uh, also reproductive endocrinology, and then I should see if I can organize something. So this is how I first came to Perth in Western Australia, and basically, Yes, managed to convince uh, the conservation department uh, to let me do look at the Western Swamp turtles they had, which was not many, very few. They were basically at this time, it was less, about 30 were left in the wild, we now know, and there were 17 captive animals. So the world population was less than 50 individuals when I started the whole thing. Uh, 
And uh, yes, so this is how it started, my involvement with the Western Swamp Turtle. That's interesting. It was related to your interest in endocrinology and reproductive biology, and there was that connection there, and that and you sort of got uh, that opportunity. That's it's really cool. I I will definitely go into that and and sort of the the research you did and how that informed sort of the captive management aspect of things. But sort of taking a step back, um, for people that may not be familiar with the his with the story. Uh, behind the description of the western swamp turtle it's it's pretty fascinating maybe you could shed some light on uh why that holotype that you saw was pretty significant and and sort of the gap between that and the next the next uh the most uh the recent records to it and how how it was sort of rediscovered okay yes uh the holotype was collected by Ludwig Price and sold. He was a natural history collector in, uh, among other things, Western Australia, the Swan River Colony, which is basically today's Perth. And he collected all sorts of specimens. I mean, there are, I think, uh, including plants and invertebrates, there are something like 100 species named Pricey after Ludwig Price. And he sold the first known specimen of Pseudomedura to the Museum of Natural History in Vienna in 1839. Uh, so Western Australia was only colonized uh, by the British Empire in 1820 nine or 27 or I think it was 29. Well, <laughs> I should know <laughs> in any case. So it was basically in between 10 years of the colonization that the first Western swamp turtle specimen known to science was collected there and uh, sold to the Vienna Museum. And there it was labeled as Prunops macquarie and uh, with the locality New Holland. So it was not, even so it was clear that Ludwig Price collected it in Western Australia because this is where he collected at that time. There was no good uh, collection locality recorded. And these specimens set in the museum, uh, well, until uh, 1901, when uh, Friedrich Siebenbrock, who was a turtle expert and very interested in turtles, went through the whole collection and found that this is really a unique taxon and described as a monotypic genus Pseudomedura and called the specimen Pseudomedura umbrina. But Nobody knew exactly where it came from, at least not in Vienna. And nobody did any background research because obviously from the collector it could have been found out where it came from. So it was a pretty unknown and forgotten species. And then, I think it was in 1953, uh, there was the first... There was another specimen picked up at a road in north of Perth and uh, given as a, as a reptile pet to a teenager boy, uh, Richard, uh, what was Boyd? Sorry, you said the name before. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the name I, I was looking back to uh, Robert Boyd, I think. Yeah, yeah, Robert Boyd was his name. And he basically exhibited it at uh, the wild uh, the wildlife show of the Natural History Club in Perth, where people could bring uh, and exhibit specimens, interesting specimens they were keeping. And 
So quite a few other naturalists like Harry Butler and Vincent Cerventi saw this specimen and thought, well, they said, well, there's nothing like a short neck turtle known in the area, so it must have been released by someone or something. But then the following year, 1954, uh, Robert Boyd actually got a second specimen from the same location. And so he suddenly exhibited two specimens of Pseudomedura at the wildlife show. And then uh, the, what, I think I was already director of the Western Australian Museum. Uh, David Wright, he uh, somehow found out about this, probably was told about this by Harry Butler, Vincent Cerventi, who were naturalists, and asked Robert Boyd if he could borrow the specimens. According to, to Robert Boyd, I talked to him before he died, and a few years ago he passed away, and uh, then uh, David, well, sorry, David Wright was a director, but it was actually, okay, what was his name? Uh, Scott, who described in a uh, in expectato, or expectato. Uh, it? Sorry? Um, his last name was Glort, wasn't it? Yes, Glort. Yeah. In any case, he was working at the museum. David Wright was a director then. Uh, and so it was described as a new species. And only, I think, two years later, uh, Williams from uh, where did he work? Scott, you would know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I got described it and then, yeah, only a couple of no, years he, later. He basically, he found out and pointed out that this is actually a synonym for Pseudomedura umbrina, which was described by Simo. Yeah, so it was, it was quite a convoluted history the rediscovery of the species and the details. And in the 1950s, it was mainly, today you would say, citizen scientists, so naturalists. And then the museum, mainly David Wright, the director, who did all the early survey work and tried to find out more about this uh, unknown species so to say right it's it's a real interesting history it's it's pretty captivating that it was described long before it was it was rediscovered and and sort of sat there kind of um not really analyzed and then it kind of that that rediscovery brought it all back so th there's something that uh, presumably now the the species is extremely and and as you've mentioned it, it the populations have dropped to in the tens at at and in at some point in the 1980s but uh it's very localized it, it only occurs in a small area uh but in the past it it had more of an extensive range uh, in terms of the threats uh i'm curious what contributed to the overall decline from what presumably was a historically pretty expansive range um, and what contemporarily now are the biggest issues for the swamp the swamp turtles okay uh, I think the historic pre-european range was also not extensive but it certainly encompassed uh, a lot of the suitable habitat in the Swan Coastal Plain of Western Australia, which extends uh, from about Donnybrook in the south to the Moor River in the north. It's probably 
150 kilometers in total, uh, but then only really long the mountain range. Well, as an Austrian, I wouldn't call them mountains, <laughs> but still. <laughs> Hills. <laughs> so to say. <laughs> but uh, basically in alluvian clay soils, uh, this ephemeral and seasonal clay pans and swamps, this is what the Western Swamp Turtle is uh, specialized on. And unfortunately, or well, this is simply the situation, these are some of the most fertile soils in the whole of Western Australia, if you want. And so even in the 19th century, these were the first areas cleared for agriculture and drained for agriculture. So the main issue for the Western Swamp Turtle is really habitat loss. And this from early on, since colonization started, so to say. And so when it was rediscovered in uh, the 1950s, probably most of the habitat has already been lost to development, mainly agricultural development, but then also uh, basically all the houses of Perth, which you see today, uh, a lot of them are brick houses and all the clay for these bricks has been mined in former Western swamp turtle habitat. Uh, so agricultural development directly uh, conversion of habitat uh, for suburban housing and the urban use and industrial use and uh, agriculture and clay mining. These are the main threats from very early on. And in the 1950s, only really two small habitat areas with populations uh, have been found and surveyed. And so pretty much these were then the only viable populations. But in the 1960s, there was a PhD, first a group honors project and then a PhD done, mainly on their biology. The PhD was done by Andrew Burbage and uh, he estimated that the population was about 200 individuals in those two reserves. This was in the mid-1960s. So still a very small number. Right. That I'm, I'm, I'm from uh, Southern California in the United States, and we, there's some it, the, in really interesting ecology the species has. It's like a... Out here, we have the Western spadefoot toads, and they seem to have kind of a similar ecology and a and and sort of a a similar uh, slew of of threats that are that they're facing. It's kind of a, a interesting parallel between the turtles and the toads. Um, yeah, so it, 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 sort of in, in in line with the conservation, um, you worked on. I, I begin the the first. I I think the first one was uh, you wrote it in 1994 for the. Western Swamp Turtle Recovery Plan, uh, and, and then updated this. Um, and, it, and I was going through those, um, and there's some interesting things. It's cool to see how things changed over time in terms of when you would uh, propose something as a management tool for the species and then come back and then analyze whether that worked or not and so on. Uh, and one of the things you pointed out in there was there were some issues with foxes and there the there was need to fence in habitat, uh, but there may have been some unintended consequences with that. It, maybe if you could just speak to that and what implications that has for general conservation projects. Well, the situation was really in the late 1980s. Uh, there, there was not a lot of background information known about Pseudomidura umbrina biological information. The main 
information came from the PhD study, which was done by Andrew Burwich in the mid 1960s. And, um, well, it just happened uh, that 1964, 65, when he did his main field work, were the, the wettest two years in a row ever since. So uh, basically, uh, the weather, the climate or weather situation in those years has never been repeated since. And so a lot of his results are really specific for very wet years for this region, which has not been understood well for a long time. Because after this PhD study, which was published in 1967, well, the PhD, yes, was published in 1967, the thesis, uh, there was no really concerted further study of the wild, the biology and the wild population. There were still uh, annual surveys of the two population conducted by the conservation department, but no, and they recorded the decline of the species, but there was no good attempt uh, with the benefit of hindsight to really uh, address this. I mean, for me personally, it's interesting that even in the 1960s, uh, certainly the citizens of Perth or Western Australia were very uh, conservation oriented. The, the probably the word conservation didn't exist in then in the meaning it has today. But uh, the two nature reserves, which were created specifically for the Western Swamp Turtle in 1962, uh, one of them was actually acquired through a public appeal for donations to the citizens of Perth. And so even then, half the money for the acquisition of this nature reserve was donated by private Perth people. And this for a small turtle, which is very cryptic, very hard to see, which is one reason why they have been somehow forgotten and overlooked for so long. And for some reason, this we're still able to capture the imagination of uh, the public, which I find quite amazing personally. And it's still today we have Western, Friends of the Western Swamp Turtle Community Group, which now has about 600 members. So there's a bit of a lobby group, which is very helpful. And okay. Um, telling too many stories. What was exactly your question? <laughs> no, I, I think that, that that's 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 great. Uh, just going down different rabbit holes uh, in terms of just um, so, so just curious in the recovery plan. You mentioned that. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. There were some issues with mammals. Well, yeah. In the fence basically, yes, basically uh, because of the limited knowledge general on the ecology and biology we had, which was mainly based on very wet years, which have not been repeated since. Uh, there was a lot of unknown things. So we didn't have any good data. We, we knew that they have declined from about 200 individuals to some third individuals over two decades, but we didn't understand why. At the time when we thought we really have to take conservation actions. So the problem, once a species is down to such a critical stage 
is really that you have to take conservation actions without the background information which you should have to actually uh, do any any reasonable management actions. So basically, the hypothesis then was foxes, and this was recorded, foxes kill western swamp turtles. And foxes are introduced in Australia. Uh, the population of foxes increased a lot in western Australia between the 1970s and uh, late 1980s. And so the the main hypothesis was that fox predation may be the main reason why in particular one population, the larger population has nearly disappeared. And so the idea then was that, okay, we should really somehow exclude foxes from the then last persisting wild population, uh, which persisted on its own, to secure it and then to captive breeding to increase the overall number of animals. So these were the strategies. It was actually as yeah, the first recovery plan was from 1994, but the first management plan was actually published in 1990 and then transformed into a recovery plan. And so, so the main strategies was that yes, to try and exclude foxes and then uh, this last wild population was secured with a fox proof fence. But main, the area where we were thinking, uh, they are restricted to, which was also not correct. And, and then captive breeding. The, the problem with captive breeding was that uh, the first Western swamp turtles were taken into captivity in 1959. Then by David Wright, the director of the Western Australian Museum and then transferred to, it was 25 individuals, wild caught individuals. We don't really know where they were caught, but, uh, and they were transferred then to Perth Zoo in 19, 17, 1964, I think. And then there was some breeding going on in the zoo, but it then became, during the 1970s, quite erratic and, there wasn't much hatchling production. And then the conservation department uh, in the early or late, I think it was 1979, uh, took over the breeding efforts in a newly established wildlife research center then. Uh, and they also took some more wild individuals into captivity, but again, it wasn't very successful. They had, they had some eggs and some hatchlings in, I think, 1980 and 1981. And the hatchlings all died in their first year of life, more or less. So the, the efforts to raise them didn't work. And then there was no, no more eggs laid in the captive colony. Uh, until 1987 when they arrived in Perth. And so the situation then in some way was really desperate <laughs> for the species because most people thought they are, the turtles which are still around are too old to breed. They may be senile because they were mostly collected in 1959 and so basically people had pretty much given up hope for the species then and and we didn't really know what was going on and so with the benefit of hindsight we did some things which were wrong and one of them was to concentrate 
on this fox-proof fence and the exclusion of foxes from uh, basically the last persisting wild population. Because what we found out later over really the decades is that individuals have can have huge home ranges and are very far moving and do not handle fences well, which we found out pretty soon and then did adaptive management to, well, ameliorate the problems the fences caused. Uh, but uh, it basically took us, so the first fence around the persisting population was built in, 19, I think it was finished in 1991, 1990. And then for two, three years afterwards, I, I really intensively studied this population and found nests. Nobody has ever seen a, the nest of a Western swamp turtle before. And it's also interesting because they nest, their, their nesting behavior is different from all the other turtles. They nest, basically dig the nest with the front legs and not the hind legs, like other turtles. Things like this. Uh, nearly everything is a bit different with the Pseudomedura to other turtles. In any case, uh, so in the, in the first three years after the fence was built, they had basically zero nest predation. Well, the foxes were kept out, which are major nest predators in Australia, and there was no nest predation. And then I didn't monitor there because the focus of the whole conservation program then changed over to reintroductions and so on. Uh, I didn't monitor any nests until in, in this population until 2006. And then we suddenly found that yes, there's 100% nest predation by Bandicoot, locally called Gwenda. And, and then retrospectively we found out that basically after the nest, the fence was constructed, uh, uh, which kept out the foxes, the, all the juvenile population completely crashed in the mid-1990s, 1995, 1996. So there was zero recruitment over a period of time in the mid 1990s and so it really is what what we know now i had since then a honors and a master student looking at this issue and yes they found that uh, first bandicoots for western swamp turtles are the main nest predators not foxes or any any other animals. Uh, and second, that the fence uh, basically uh, more, well, it's, it's called meso predator release. So the, the bandicoots could really breed up to enormously, well, relatively high densities because we kept out the foxes, which are the main controllers of the bandicoots. And so, yes, the benefit of hindsight, it would have been better not <coughs> to create a proof fence around this population. And then also because it really disrupted the home ranges of individuals, of individual uh, turtles. I have a question about how effective have all these measures been? Like, what's the population size today for the swamp turtle? Well, the population size, it's its only a crude estimate, unfortunately, because we now have basically five locations where we do the okay. translocations to reestablish or establish new populations. Uh, it's probably 
we not do not count the recently released animals and do not count hatchlings, then it would probably be 250 to 300 individuals. Uh, but then the adult population is still probably around 60 individuals. This is my estimate. Uh, because we, the breeding program now works very well and we release a lot of juveniles or even hatchlings. And so there's still the, well, hatchlings and juveniles obviously have a higher mortality rate than adults or larger sub-adults and so on. But the main problem or one problem for the program is now to actually find habitat areas where we can release the animals which are bred in captivity. And uh, so we are now at the stage where we have to, uh, where we can basically breed more uh, offspring than we need for conservation or recovery purposes, which is, a, well, it's, it's a nice thing to achieve, I would say. <laughs> and so we are definitely thinking that we are currently drafting, we have a new draft recovery plan where we propose new strategies also in regard to captive breeding and captive raising of hatchlings. And the other thing is that so far, until last year at least, all the eggs and the, the whole breeding program is not done by Pursu since 1990 or 1991. In any case, uh, and also Melbourne Zoo and Monato Zoo in, uh, ah, not Melbourne Zoo, sorry, Adelaide Zoo and Monato Zoo in Southern Australia. They also have a breeding colony there. And so, yes. We are now looking more and more also to no longer to artificially incubate the eggs, but to let them incubate in the nests the females construct and probably to translocate eggs into artificial nests. Uh, I had, a, well, first honors and then master student, Nick Rodriguez. He did a lot of uh, work on the nest ecology and all the nest predation and all these things. And uh, now over the last few decades, we get more and more information worldwide that incubation conditions uh, certainly influence hatchling performance in many ways and also uh, morphology in some way. And so we think if we translocate eggs, we may get from the start uh, better locally or natural selection to <laughs> select uh, better locally adapted individuals than if we artificially incubate and raise them in captivity until for a few years head start, uh, typically head starting program. Uh, so we, are, we may and partly started uh, in the last breeding season, the last months, uh, to do this. Uh, so obviously, a conservation strategy, if you work with a species which is down to the last few handful of individuals, is different from once you reach the point that you can breed so many and have so many that you no longer know what to do. Well, so to say, we are to, that really the, the main limiting factor is a suitable habitat to release them. And this is what we reach now, which is really a nice uh, conservation achievement, I think. It definitely is. It's it's definitely a success story, and um, the, I'm certainly still things to to do to make it better. But it, it's uh, it's 
seems to be in a good place. It, but the 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 and certainly that applies to the captive, the sort of ex C two situation. But that that wasn't always the case. Um, there was one statistic in in one of the the recovery plans that stood out to me is between 1959 and 1981 there were 65 uh, swamp turtles that came into captivity but by 1981 only 17 of them were alive um, yes. and so you came you came into that situation in the late 80s and studied the reproductive biology and the gametogenesis of the swamp turtles and that drastically in, increased the amount of viability of the eggs and the recruitment and that's what got the program to what it is today uh, i'm sort of curious what's known about uh what what things did you learn that weren't implemented before that helped increase the production and and yes. viability so much well i my <clears throat> scientific background at the time was certainly a reproductive physiology of turtles uh, in many ways but the thing in hindsight i think more important was probably my personal experience when i was young in breeding turtles and tortoises myself uh, so i was yes when i in my teens and early 20s, I kept a lot of turtles and other reptiles and, and was breeding them. So I was basically like a hobby reptile keeper, if you want. Uh, well, I largely gave this up in the mid 1980s, but I had this background. And in regard to the Western swamp turtles when I came to Perth in 1987. Uh, well, I was thinking with the situation, there was then only three breeding females of breeding age in captivity. And I think no, no wild female has been seen for a few years then. So nobody knew if there were any more females. And uh, the conservation department then actually every year in spring they radiographed the females to see if any of them has eggs and they didn't have eggs for six years then. And so I was thinking, well, what can I do? The radiography obviously didn't work to find out what, what the problem is for these females. And so at this stage, I was actually pretty much the first uh, to use ultrasound to look at uh, the ovaries of female turtles. Uh, so I did this first in 1987. And I have actually a publication, it's in German, which was 1988 in Herpeto Zoa. <laughs> the Austrian magazine and uh, so I've, what I found is that hey all, all of those three last females mature females in captivity have basically follicles developing uh, when I first looked at them and looked at them in sequence and I convinced the conservation department, they were then in the Wildlife Research Center, to let me do this. I said, look, ultrasound is used in pregnant women for a lot. And so it doesn't seem to be, to, to cause any problems to embryos or whatever. It's uh, opposed to frequently radiographing females and so yes i got to go ahead and did this and then i wrote a proposal based on the what i found out about the biology from mainly andrew burwich's earlier study and from my own observations and 
proposed that uh, from, this was in 1987, that they, the females should be separated from the males from September onwards and receive more food than they eat every day in September, October. And so, because nobody had any idea what they could possibly do to get them to breed, they followed my advice. And two of those females, which had not produced any eggs for six years at least, they, they actually uh, ovulated and produced eggs, an egg clutch each. And when this happened, uh, the conservation department asked me if I would be interested to set up a breeding program because they realized, hey, I seem to know things they didn't know or be able to find out things uh, nobody there has previously done. And so this is what, how I really became involved in this whole program. And so ultrasound uh, scanning uh, of, yeah, of the reproductive tract of turtles was certainly a major thing why I was able to convince the authorities uh, to get this whole breeding program going. But probably more important was my personal experience with breeding turtles, which uh, basically no one had in Western Australia at that time. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. All, all sort of your different professions kind of coming, or different interests coming together. Uh, that, that, that's a really cool thing. Um, something that I, I, I was reading that, that you'd done that, that was curious to me, I, I'm, I'm interested in why this is. You mentioned that this species for the females, the vitalogenesis occurs during astivation. And I'm, it doesn't seem like that should be something that's physiologically beneficial. Why, why is that? I do not know. <laughs> I still do not know. But yes, it's interesting that vitalogenesis, at least between half and three quarters of vitalogenesis uh, takes place during the estivation period, uh, basically based on stored energy reserves in the female and also the males, I have less information regarding the males, but uh, to me, it's quite clear that a spermatogenesis also takes place over the summer when they estivate. Uh, so even so, they obviously reduce, drastically reduce their metabolism over the estivation period, uh, there's enough, obviously, uh, to keep those processes going, which is spermatogenesis and vitalogenesis, which is also, well, it's certainly uh, the vitalin is produced by the liver. Uh, so it's, there's some metabolic action going on in the animals. And they also, in particular the adults, uh, females and males, they actually thermoregulate over the estivation period. Uh, so once it gets cooler in autumn, uh, they in summer they tend to stay underground where it doesn't get too hot because Perth is a Mediterranean climate similar to actually California pretty much Southern California. Uh, so it's a winter rain area and very dry and hot summers. And uh, 
Yes, once autumn comes and there's still no water around, they all, the males and females in particular, they come to the surface and hide in sunny spots uh, under, under some cover of grass or low bushes and so on. But they really seek sun exposure to warm up during the day. And I'm pre it, it doesn't make, make sense if uh, the goal is metabolic, metabolic shutdown, so to say, shutdown of metabolism. But it makes sense if you have to keep your vitellogenesis and spermo, spermiogenesis going. You don't, in particular, spermio, spermatogenesis and spermogenesis uh, usually doesn't work in turtles at low temperatures, so they need relatively higher temperatures. And they definitely, even during the estivation period, uh, thermoregulate, seek the right microclimate to keep these processes going, which is probably a little bit unusual. Yeah, I, I found that pretty interesting, too, because it, it, it's uh, with something else with the climate change modeling that your group is doing that it there were some pretty complex energy models that you you guys produced. And they showed that there was kind of a high uh, somatic maintenance cost for the swamp turtles. And I just found it, it it's interesting that they can maintain that and have a pretty high energy demand yes. for yes, soma. It's Yes, it it sounds like an oxymoron in some way, <laughs> but yeah. uh, the situation for Pseudomedura is really that the main energy intake uh, over the whole year happens in a in a short time space in spring. Well, they are they are mainly winter and spring active, uh, so when there's enough water around. They only feed underwater on live prey. And uh, in winter, obviously, the temperatures are so low that it's a bit difficult to process uh, the food. And so the main food intake and food processing happens in spring when it warms up a bit before it becomes too hot in summer. And so it's concentrated to a very short time of the year. And for females, an edit problem is that at the same time, they also produce the eggs. So uh, there's some congestion in the body cavity of females, which again may limit the amount of food they can eat at that time. Uh, and then with the hatchlings, the hatchlings emerge usually in autumn and during the first growing season, the first wet season, they have pretty much to quadruple their hatching weight or we may never see them again. They don't survive the first summer. So the hatchlings, in particular the hatchlings, they really have uh, to eat and process food and grow as much in the first season as they can, or they, they seem to perish. We never see them again, it's as simple as this. And which really means, yes, they, they have to put a lot of the emphasis into somatic growth particularly during the first year of life. And, uh, well, this is where then this energy model comes in, which is obviously based on uh, the data we got from them, which is pretty amazing because it's usually uh, a strategy of very short-lived species, which only live like for one year or two. They would also put a lot into somatic growth early on and, and then reproduce and then 
uh, do not make it very long. Like on those reptiles, uh, a good example for this is chameleon. Well, it's not different genus, no. Is it Furtz? No, not Furtz. It's Labordi. Labordi uh, from Western Madagascar. They also work. They know them very well. They basically, they live in a summer rainfall area where their activity season is only five, about five months of the year. And the hatchlings hatch at the start of the rainy season. And then they have to basically lay the first clutch of the end of this first rainy season. So in between five months, they have to grow enough and mature enough and take, well, process enough energy to actually reproduce. And then they die off. And only the hatchlings for the next, that hatch at the next, uh, the start of the next rainy season survive. And very interestingly, Pseudomedura, in particular the hatchlings, they follow the same metabolic principle. But then they're extremely long lived. <laughs> they live probably up to 100 years individuals. So it's, it's somehow. Yes, uh, contradiction in itself. Their, their whole metabolic uh, strategy, if you want. Uh, so I find this quite fascinating, <laughs> I have to say. Yeah, it's it's another one of the sort of exceptions about their biology you, you mentioned. They're, they're just yes, a bit different yes. there. No they, do yeah. nearly, no, they do a lot of things differently from other species and reptiles and so on. Right. So, so I'm, I'm also curious um, in terms of reproductive endocrinology, have you done work with that with swamp turtles or what's known about that? Uh, basically nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry, because of... Uh, the conservation status of the species, which is critically endangered, and because of the general success I had with reproducing them, uh, I never got permission to actually do any endocrinological work with them. Uh, because everybody said, look, why do you need it? It works anyhow which is obviously right. Mm -hmm. And so even so, my background is pretty much, well, not pretty much, but to some degree, also a productive endocrinology of turtles. I uh, have never done any hormone measurements in Western swamp turtles. Okay, yeah, and that, that was sort of deemed uh, the the breeding's working. Like, there's no need to sort of to understand that more. <laughs> well, well, people then uh, today it's different. Today they are more critically endangered uh, turtles, unfortunately, around than Western swamp turtles. But thirty years ago, and maybe even twenty years ago, it was still considered the world's most critically endangered uh, turtle. And because, yes, the recovery program uh, went ahead and was successful without any endocrinological work, uh, the conservation authorities uh, never approved any uh, hormone work with Western swamp turtles so far because uh, they didn't see any need for it, which is right. probably true. Okay. Yeah, so I, we, I think we'll sort of, we can transition in a second to kind of the um, one last section of this. But I, while we're sort of on the topic of uh, the reproductive sort of biology of the species, I, something uh, Jack and I were at the Turtle Conservancy last year. We worked up there and I got, it, I got a, a copy of your book up there. So I was going through that. And something that you mentioned in the book that I, I found pretty interesting is that you've actually seen uh, ovulation the moment that it happens and have visualized that. 
I'm curious if that was something that you've seen in a swamp turtle or what the circumstances for that were. Well, uh, I've seen it. Yes, I, I've seen it in a swamp turtle. Basically, ovulation is a very quick process. Uh, the, the follicle, well, in the pre ovulatory follicle, uh, the follicular wall ruptures, and then the, the egg cell, which is a whole yolk, uh, squeezes out of this rupture. So they form something like an hourglass form, but it's probably only for really seconds. And then once they reach the, ost the ostium of the oviduct, basically envelops uh, the preovulatory follicles. And so they directly uh, rupture and get caught by the ostium of the oviduct. And once they enter the oviduct, they, they are not clearly round anymore, the yolk or the egg cell, but it gets a little bit elongated in the form. And so for a few years, we ultrasound scanned uh, females around the time of ovulation, uh, at least daily or several times a day often. Uh, because in the early st stages, we also wanted to find out how long the whole oviducal period lasts so that we can predict when they will nest. Uh, so we try to find out when they ovulate uh, to predict when a particular female will nest. And so I think it's pure luck that I have actually two ultrasound photos, which I think show the actual process of ovulation, which is this, uh, well, the, the first process is <laughs> when really the egg cell uh, starts to squeeze out of uh, the follicular wall rupture. And then it, when it slips out, it takes on such an hourglass form. And then probably a few seconds later, it's again pretty round and then further down in the oviduct becomes elongated. But I wouldn't put my hand in the fire that, uh, I mean, this is the theoretical process, but to actually show it in ultrasound uh, would require, well, a lot. We never wanted to really like stress females too much and so on, in particular at the time of ovulation. Uh, so we didn't really do it in any extensive way to try and uh, visualize this. But it it happened uh, two or three times that we think we saw it and actually took photos, uh, photos to show it. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend uh, doing this in any targeted way because it would be too much disruption for the females. And the other thing is the females very were very used and relaxed during ultrasound scanning. And we do it directly in the water. So we do not even have to take the female out of the water. We can just hold it, put the ultrasound probe there. And so they do not, the females uh, which are used to this procedure, when we do it directly in the water in the enclosure, they are not really stressed much at all. But I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't do it with wild females or females that are not uh, well, well used to the procedure and so on.
Right. That's something. And uh, uh, that sort of brings up one more question in this area that, that I'm curious, because uh, you, you talk about it in reproductive biology, the colonia, um, is the sperm storage in turtles. It's a topic that's come up on our, our podcast multiple times. Um, but the dynamic for how that actually works is kind of curious. Maybe you can just explain sort of briefly how that that works. Well, it's, it has only been started and not by myself. I never really looked at uh, the sperm storage site, but it seems to, again, depend on the species, or turtle species. Uh, it can be in the lower oviduct, like the uterine section in some species, or higher up, uh, not in the ostium, but certainly in uh, the glandular section where also the albumen is uh, secreted. And there are basically folds and caverns in the uh, oviducts. It's still not really known if there is any nutritional support for the sperm coming from the females or not, or if the sperm can survive on its own for years, basically. We know even with the Western Swamp Turtles, uh, at least for two or three years, they can produce fertile eggs after any contact with males. So this is, seems to be quite widespread in turtles generally. Uh, the, interestingly, there are a few turtles where females only overlaid uh, after basically mating. Um, ovulation has to be induced by mating or copulation. Interestingly, uh, Astrochilis inifera, the highly endangered one, is one of those species where females only overlaid if during the early breeding season they actually copulated with a male. If there's no copulation, they simply don't overlaid, which is unusual for turtles, but also the loggerhead sea turtle, it's the same. Interesting. And so something about something about the combat or the movement in, it initiates the ovulation. Is that the logic behind that? We, it's not really known, huh. but I know it's certainly there has to be direct contact in 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 Ifora and probably also in Carreta Carreta. I don't remember for Carreta Carreta. I wasn't involved with this at all, but with Ifora. It's actually, there must be physical contact with a male. I cannot say it has to be like copulation and insemination, but certainly uh, male activity, uh, male mating activity with a female. Otherwise, they don't overlay the female. Yeah. But I cannot, then they can also store sperm because it's enough. Uh, if there's one mating event, even prior to the actual nesting season, then they will overlay all for the next six months through the nesting season, five or six months. Oh, wow. So it doesn't have to be prior to every ovulation, but at least uh, for one reproductive season. They only invest, if you want, into ovulation if they had direct contact with a male. It's, it's really interesting. It's, so sort of it's transitioning. In the book, all, all this, I brought the book 25 years ago. I, I now would have to completely rewrite it in many, in many regards, because we, we know now much more about the reproductive biology, generally turtles. Okay. Yeah. And, and so in terms of sort of the, the wrapping up and with the, the conservation of the swamp turtles, um, curious climate change is sort of a big, uh, 
uh, kind of a, a, a big unknown factor in terms of how it will impact certain species. How, what, what are the predicted effects on swamp turtles and how much ambiguity is there in, 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 those, in those predictions? Well, the, the climate change predictions for southwestern Australia is that it basically becomes drier and hotter. And the winter rains start later and there's less rainfall. Uh, and obviously winter and spring rains, if you live in ephemeral wetlands or ephemeral and seasonal wetlands, is very important. So if the activity season is too short, <coughs> females do not produce eggs. The other thing I didn't mention before is that the whole, the, the females basically they grow, uh, their phytogenesis and grow follicles every year. But they only overlap if they have basically feeding peak, peak and high food intake in early spring and September. If for some reason they do not have this, and this can be the case in very dry years, there's simply not enough water and food around, then they don't overlay it, but reabsorb the follicles, the pre-evolutory follicles, uh, probably to conserve the energy. So they don't invest into reproduction if it's not a good year, uh, which is different to a lot of other turtles, like the local long neck turtles, Kilodino oblonga, once they have pre-evolutory follicles, they overlay them, no matter what. And the Western swamp turtles don't do this. So it's a much more liberal situation in some ways. And uh, so I got a bit sidetracked again. What was your question? <laughs> Is it, in terms of uh, the client, like what would be the potential? Uh, change, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So obviously, uh, and, uh, in a drying climate, if the wet season becomes too short, then females will not reproduce, will not lay eggs. Hatchlings will not survive. Uh, and well, the whole life cycle uh, is, uh, is very much constrained and uh, the aggravated this is climate change situation obviously by habitat loss uh, because the habitat areas are so small there is not much possibility for them to move to deeper wetlands because Basically, in particular in the Swan Coastal Plain, and the, with those uh, two populations, which were still around in the 1960s, uh, there's a lot of development pressure around uh, those sites, and a lot of industrial clay mining still, and housing developments, and agriculture, all this. It's getting more and more developed areas. And so they basically have little opportunity. The, the swamp turtles can move for kilometers over even cleared land in search of other wetlands, which they can use as refuges. They also use farm dams on private properties when it's a drier year. And now with climate change, all this is aggravated. But then once they move out of the reserved habitat areas uh, onto private land mainly, then or they, and they, they can cross roads and all this, even in the fenced reserves, they climb over the fences to get out. Uh, so there's there's higher, much higher mortality, if you want. Right. We actually had one turtle 
which used to live in the one nature reserve walking four kilometers uh, over cleared land, crossing two roads, climbing over two fences, burning up in the other nature reserve. And so they, they definitely uh, can be very far moving and do move far. And so the situation uh, of climate change is certainly drastically worsened by the habitat loss and habitat fragmentation they're exposed to. So it's a combined effect of climate change and habitat loss. If the habitat loss, if there would be more habitat, they would have more options to deal with climate change than they have today. Right, that, that makes sense. I, I'm sort of curious too, what, what's the most interesting thing you've seen a swamp turtle do or the most interesting observation in your, that you, uh, yeah. <laughs> most interesting observation. Well, I just mentioned they can climb over fences, even if they are 2.2 meters high, and they, they do it. And it was interesting because with all the fence issues I mentioned before, quickly at some stage in the in 97, we developed and tested then such uh, one-way tunnels with flap doors where they can basically go in one direction through a fence. And uh, this was done by a postdoc at the time, a French postdoc, she's Languillot. She now lives in Florida. And uh, she, she tested first these different models we had in the zoo, in the captive colony, only with males because of females and so on where uh, didn't want to disrupt their life too much. And so she had a only limited number of males at that time to test. And so she tested the same individual after a few days again, if it would go through this tunnel. So she built basically a fence, uh, separating a little corner in the enclosure from the pond, and then put the turtle there and the turtle wanted to go back to the water and then, yes, went through all these uh, models we had and we tested how they do it, how long they do it. And one individual was tested for some reason a third time. And this male, basically, when it was a third time, it, and it, it already knew the game. So it looked with one eye through the tunnel and then it looked up the fence and then it climbed over the fence instead of going through the tunnel and so they, they certainly they have the individualities and i mean this was a funny story uh, but they're, they're certainly special in many ways and I was also very surprised by, it was also a young male, which actually walked the four kilometers over clear land and roads and developed areas from one of the nature reserves to the other one. And then, uh, yeah, ended up there. Uh, so they do all sorts of interesting things. It's always fun to hear about the anecdotal stuff that might not make it into a paper, but it's just sort of cool stories. Yeah. Uh, so we can probably talk, we'll touch on this uh, kind of briefly, the anatomical aspect of the swamp turtles and uh, sort of curious, this may, may be more for Scott, um, a, a, more of a question, but uh, Dr. Kukling, if you want to add anything, feel free. Uh just curious, just maybe a rundown of the unique anatomical aspects. We've talked about the unique biological aspects of the swamp turtle, but is there anything that stands well, out? I need to leave this to Scott. 
Scott, if you want to take over. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I guess one of the most unique features of this species would be its skull. Um, I, I think it has an extremely unique skull amongst the Chelidae in general, the whole family. Um, it has a fully roofed skull, more like a podocnemus in a lot of ways, but um, I mean, it's not structured the same way as a podocnemus, but it, it's a little reminiscent of it. Um, in that the um, sidewalls of the skull are fully enclosed in, which is unusual for Chelids. And um, it's um, got an extremely short neck compared to even many short necks. And um, it structurally internally inside the shell is um, extremely simplified and primitive in the, in the structure of the struts at the front of the carapace. Um, which is very also extremely interesting. Um, obviously, it has um, morphological structures that are in tune with its lifestyle as well, of course. Um, it has um, much freer toes and stuff like that. It's not, I, I think, not one of the greatest swimmers amongst turtles. <laughs> um, it can walk, certainly, and it stays underwater fine, and it does things like that. But it's... Um, it's not built for, you know, high-speed swimming or anything like that. And um, keelids, of course, are a um, aquatic species in general, but this one has sort of headed away from that to a degree, and um, which is why I, it doesn't surprise me that it can walk four kilometres over land because it's actually built a little for being spending some time on land rather than water. Um, it's well built for um, hiding itself um, in amongst detritus or under leaf litter or anything like that. It's very flat shell um, compared to a lot of keelids. So, yeah, it has some very unique anatomical features. Do you think having a – what's the the purpose of having a roofed over skull like that other keelids don't have? Is, is, there, is it even known or could that serve any feature? Probably defensive. Um, if nothing else, um, I can't imagine many other reasons it would have done it. I mean, it had to evolve it um, because that's not where keelids come from. Um, keelids come from the highly imaginated skull morphology. That's their, that's their history um, in their evolutionary line. So this has uniquely evolved it. And um, so, yeah, I would have to say it would be likely defensive. Um, it spends a lot of time on land, so it's probably required that. Um, as Gerald said, it has a long history of bandicoot <laughs> um, predation, so it probably mm -hmm. has... Yes, I can, I can add to this. Yeah, I, I fully agree with Scott that it's mainly a predator defense mechanism. The, the swamp turtles are very good in actually pulling, well, all the legs and tail and neck and head under the shell. And when they do it, in particular if they feel threatened, uh, they actually turn the head sideways. Oh so God. it's only the fully ossified skull roof, which uh, is visible from the head and the outside. And they also have these uh, tubercles on the neck. Uh, so the only thing you see in a fully uh, retracted Western swamp turtle is actually the skull roof and uh, the tubercles of the neck, which is obviously not very attractive for Predators like Bandicoot and so on. What it, it's it's interesting that that's that's a characteristic, and that 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 that, that sort of predator prey dynamic could have shaped that over time. Um, what what's known about the because it's got a really interesting range in terms of specific events that led to the biogeography of the species. Um, there is no, yeah, sorry. Well. I guess one of the things we've got to look at with this group, and I'm going to call it a group for a minute, because um, 
there is a fossil of um, a pseudomadura like animal from Riversley, which is in far northern Australia. And, um, but one of the mistakes I think a lot of people make is they think that the one from Riversley is similar to the one from Perth. Not likely at all. Um, they may have been in the same subfamily, they may even have been in the same genus, but they are not the same species. And um, so, how the swamp turtle in Perth lived and how the one that was obviously in Riversley lived are probably two totally different things. And um, so, um, it's, uh, I, I actually almost consider it, I don't know if Gerald would agree, I, I almost consider this species to be a, um, almost an extremophile um, among turtles, as in it, it's very, very highly evolved to be in a very specific environment um, which was found around Perth, and that's why it's limited to its range in Perth, um, because that environment only really exists or existed in that area. Um, and um, it's evolved to that probably through necessity. Um, many um, species or groups of turtles within Australia are only found in the east. There's not actually much in the west. Um, in comparison. And this has occurred because as Australia moved north, um, species have tended to move south. Um, now, they, initially they came from the south into Australia, but then as Australia moved north, they moved south because keelids are cold climate turtles in comparison to many other groups. Um, the western swamp turtle has gone down the west coast of Australia and um, ended up in Perth, whereas most of the species may have done some of their expansion in evolving in northern Australia and then moved down the east coast, giving them more options. And so you get more variety um, and less specialization. Um, and I think that's what is the issue with um, Western Swamp Turtle. Um, yes, there's all the modern conservation issues. That's not what I'm getting at. Um, what I'm getting at is how it evolved the way it is. And um, it evolved the way it is because it's found in a very, very specific set of climatic conditions, um, the ephemeral waterways of um, the Perth area. And uh, that's what it's evolved to live in. And, and yeah, I honestly think it's a form of an extremophile for a turtle, um, as in it's, it's so specific now in its um, requirements that any changes from that are likely to lead to major issues for the species, which is true of many extremophiles. That's an, it's an interesting idea, way to look at that. And, and from the conservation perspective, right, if, if it's just adapted for that habitat, and it, this could have been millions of years that it's been spe specialized for that, that it can't lose it. And, and it's just gonna, I mean, it, it's sort of evidenced just by, the fact that it was almost lost and 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 still is in sort of precarious situation, although a lot of uh, progress has been made and 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 it's a successful story thus far. Um, and in terms of the relationships, the the species seems to be kind of a uh, a relatively uh, basal in terms of Kellid's lineage uh, or. Yeah, lineage. Um, maybe you could speak to that and what's known about its relationship to other keywords. It's basal to the killer DNA, um, not so much the killers. Um I think when you, when you look at a, a species, you've got to look at it in two ways. One is the species, and that's probably fairly modern. But And then the lineage. How old is the lineage? Where does it come from? That is probably very old. And I think the um, what's happened with Pseudomadura is that it's a very, very early offshoot from the Australian radiation of the Keelans. And um, I think in one of our previous chats, I, I commented that I don't believe that Shortneck is the, um, the basal form of Keelans. I think Longneck is. And... Um, so obviously it's become a short neck, it's fully roofed its skull, it's um, done this, and I think it's done it separately to the other short neck keywords in Australia. Um, and the long necks have just continued through. And um, 
In recent years, it's now been recognised as its own subfamily, the Pseudomedurinae, and um, that's a valid way of looking at it. It has some extremely ancient um, morphologies in its um, carapace, um, particularly with the bridge struts, which are actually more like the ones in Mesoclemys than they are the ones in um, Emidura or Elsaia. Um, in part, that's because of its very flat shell, which is obviously um, used for being able to be mobile on land um, rather than water. And um, so it could have been kept for that reason. Um, it's a it's an enigma of a turtle. It really is, um, not just for all the behavioural reasons that Gerald brought up, but also its morphology. Its morphology is very unique. And I think it's um, a very ancient um, lineage that has survived for a very long time and was probably much wider distributed at various points in Australia's history, but is now only restricted to the one area near Perth. We, it, it, and, and that's, I think, another, beyond points we brought up thus far, that, that's another reason for... Uh, why conserving it's important we we had a conversation with brad schaefer a few days ago and he mentioned that carita kelly's how if you lose that species it's not only that it's a, a, a loss in terms of a species but you lose in a very ancient uh lineage and and this is at a sort of a smaller scale but as you mentioned the keladinine it's it's an ancient lineage within that group so you're losing um, maybe sort of a disproportionate amount of biodiversity in, in, from a, a, a phylogenetic perspective. There are groups of species where when you lose something, you've lost everything. Um, and I'm going to use an example that's not a turtle for a second, and that's the thylacine. Um, people, the reason the thylacine is considered um, one of the prime targets for de-extinction, which I'm not entirely a fan of, but for what it's worth, is because it represents an entire lineage of species. There is no living relative to the thylacine. And the same is true for Pseudemidura. There is no living close relative to Pseudemidura. Yes, it is a chelid, um, it is a pseudomedurin, um, whereas it, um, the rest of these chelids in Australia are, are chelidinine, so it's its own subfamily. And um, that puts it on a par with um, the um, chelinine from South America and the hydromedusinine. So that's your four main lineages of the chelidae. You lose one whole lineage. The whole lineage is gone if you lose Pseudomedura. And so it's an enormous amount of history lost by one species. Um, now, I mean, losing any species is a tragedy. And um, I don't like to um, focus it entirely that way. But the um, Caridaquilas um, that Brad brought up, obviously, I mean, that is the nearest living relative to the ancestor of all Trianicans. So, I mean, you are losing a major lineage by losing that. Same as um, Arimna Kelly's in um, Madagascar that Gerald's worked on. I mean, you lose that species, you're losing an entire lineage. Um, it's very, very ancient. And um, turtles in general are very ancient. They're very slow evolvers. They live through two mass extinctions, um, some of them will probably survive the next one. But the thing is, they um, they have time on this planet. I mean, quarter of a billion years, this group has been in one form or another on this planet. And um, they, um, they have a, a enormous lineage and enormous um, amounts of genetic reserve that is found nowhere else in the animal kingdom because it belongs to that lineage only. Right. I think that that's 
that's sort of a different kind of phylogenetic mm -hmm. argument for the conservation that we don't think about as much. So it's 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 cool to hear that. Well, I think we we sort of um, unless anyone else has anything to add, we can sort of wrap things up. Um, this has been sort of a, a really great discussion. It's been fun to focus on sort of one species in particular and really sort of dive into the weeds um, and and uh, really appreciate both of you uh, giving your time and, and telling us more about the work you've done and, and the biology of this fascinating turtle. Maybe if we can close out um, this is, uh, we've, we've talked with Scott before about this, uh, but you're welcome to, to join in again. But for, uh, Dr. Kukling, if you had one piece of advice for someone looking to make, uh, turtle or tortoise research a career, uh, what would that be? Uh, well, it's a good question. I think don't let you... A side track or sideline and keep your vision alive that you really want to do something for turtles uh, and be clear what you want to do. This is uh, in my early career. I, yes, I turned around a few times and I suddenly felt it's not really what I want to do with my life. Uh, obviously, it helps if you uh, come out of, or if you can be in a research or conservation group that is already interested in turtles. I was pretty much on my own when I started out, which in many respects can now be different. Uh, certainly, well, at least in Europe, in, in Central Europe at the time, there was only one native turtle species and not much interest in conservation and work with them. Uh, so the situation for me was certainly different. But just keep following your visions and your dream. This is my main advice. We'll take that to heart. And for listeners, uh, that's... Uh, there you go. Uh, we, we also at the end like to do something. We've done this on all 42 episodes. I did forget to mention this. We like to do a little round of turtle trivia. Um, I don't know if I, I, I keep forgetting to tell this to, to people and it always catches them off guard. But I don't know if either uh, you guys have any turtle, random turtle questions that would not be useful anywhere else except for here. That you want to ask us <laughs> if we can ask <laughs> So useless turtle information. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any sort um, of uh, yeah, if you can think of something. We you can hit us with questions, we can throw one your way. Uh that whatever well, throw me one and while I try and think of one. <laughs> all right. Well uh all right. I, I've I've got one that, that came up last week. I'm I'm sure you'll get this one. It's not actually that challenging, but it, so for North American soft shells, there's one <laughs> – actually, you'll probably have a lot more that I, I don't even know about this. But for North American soft shells, there's a feature that's distinct for uh, determining smooth versus spiny soft shells. What's that anatomical feature that's externally uh, visible? I think it's the um, pattern of spines on the back of the on the front of the carapace, isn't it? Just near the nuchal region. That, okay, that works. I'm thinking of something. Okay, uh, in the let's say on the I've head. I had to look at them in the wild. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, specifically on the on the head before you meet the carapace. I, I I have to be more specific. There's something about the the head structure that's different externally yeah it, well internally but it's visible externally it's i can only imagine it would be something like the shape of the um crystal super occipitalis or something you know, i don't know i'm not sure i haven't compared them those two species that much yeah that that's fair it's something kind of uh specific it, it's the 
the the presence of a septum in the the, the nose uh the spiny soft shells have a, a little projection in both sides oh, of the nose. yeah Fair and the smooths don't don't have that so all right well that one that was all right <laughs> you guys got anything <laughs> Having never, ha I've never actually worked on the two groups, <laughs> two species. It's fair. It's a specific. I don't know. No, I, I wouldn't have known because I, I never really looked closely or had much to do with a smooth, soft shell. I certainly have seen, and in my bad old days, kept myself some spiny soft shells, but never the smooth. <laughs> So, yeah, I wouldn't have known. Yeah, that it's a specific. It's surprising. I, I think there was a paper that that said that they were one of the least studied groups, which is surprising to me because of how. That's odd. a funny thing about North American turtles that um, many of your turtles in the U.S. are among the least studied groups. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys seem to want to go and look at turtles all over the world, but never look at your own. <laughs> yeah. Which are actually quite fascinating. You have some incredible species in the US, but you don't spend a lot of time on them. <laughs> I think that's that's some good advice. I think that, yeah, yeah that's for, for um, I know Grover Brown uh, brought this up at one point, is that he, he did some work overseas and then realized he could have a huge impact in the United States. So that's where he does a lot of his work. Well, I, I mean, that. look at your, um, uh, the, um, the species that's all around Florida, um, the semi-marine one. Um, Malacones. Yeah, Malacones. That's them. Oh, yeah. They are in, how does a does a freshwater turtle handle that much salt water? I mean, do you know what is the structure of its kidneys that it can deal with that, and um, and its diet and things like that? I mean, and you've got it split up into six subspecies, and I've looked at four of those subspecies when I was in Florida, and. Um, I'm not so sure they're really subspecies. <laughs> Honestly, they yeah. they're really very very similar. But um, the overall um, anatomical ecology, so to speak, of that taxon is spectacular. I mean, it, it's very unusual for a freshwater turtle to be that capable in saltwater. Most turtles are saltwater or freshwater. Very very few can do both because of osmotic reaction within the kidney. It's actually quite lethal to freshwater turtles. Tortoises can only get away with being in salt water because they've got no osmotic reaction to the outside world because of um, being a desert animal effectively. And that's why a tortoise can float between islands. But a keelid or something like that gets into salt water, it's basically dead. Um, the osmotic reaction will kill it. Um, and um, But that turtle seems to be able to handle it. So that's an amazing ability in one of your own turtles right yep. that, and i have no idea how it does it yeah. but yeah their taxonomy is a little bit convoluted right now too with like the, some of the subspecies don't make any sense from like a morphological or genetic standpoint yeah you guys have split to yeah. the nth degree yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that, I think that's that. That's good for in terms of uh, wrapping us up for today. Uh, thank you again uh, to uh, you, Dr. Kukling, as well as Scott for coming on today. Uh, it's really been an honor to talk to you both, and it's um, it's it's great to hear about such a a success and all the work that's been gone into the conservation of the Western Swamp Turtle. Um, and it'll be exciting to follow this in the future. So uh, thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell my stories. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for inviting me back. Really cool. Anytime. All right. Well, we'll this is uh, episode 42, and we will see you on the next one. <laughs>
thanks.